everyone. Welcome to the Australian CFO Summit. Uh, my name is Shauna. I'm a Senior Marketing Manager at Wheel. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm just going to share some of my slides and welcome the session. Bear with me. All right, so today we're here for the Masterclass uh, Avoid Insolvency, Risk Factors and Preventative Measures with the expert team from McKay Goodwin. Um, today I'm joined by Mitch Ball, um, Chief of Insolvency Operations, um, Dominic Calabretta, um, CEO, and Kate McMahon, Chief Experience Officer. Um, before we jump in, I'd just like to say a quick thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, we couldn't make today or bring today to everyone um, without them. So a huge thank you um, to them and for their support. I think we've, um, we've all been on enough webinars today to know how this works, but just really quickly, um, this session will run for roughly 45 minutes. We'll be recording it and sharing it with you afterwards. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I think we kick this off. So I'll hand across to, um, to Kate. Thanks. Um, thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, I'm super excited to have uh, Mitch and Dom here together. Collectively, they have about 50 years experience in insolvency and um, business restructuring. So today we'll take you through kind of some key um, areas which look at your risk factors and challenges. Um, preventing an insolvency event um, and what strategies you can put in place. And if you are then facing an insolvency event, what your solutions and options are. Um, so I'm just going to jump straight in and get started uh, and throw uh, to Dom and ask Dom, what are some of the risks uh, and challenges that businesses are facing um, at the moment in 2023? Um, how much time have I got? There's so many. <laughs> Um, got about 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so um, I would say right now it'd be the most challenging time for businesses in my career. Um, I started in insolvency in 2000 and I would be you know, comfortable to say right now is the toughest environment I've seen since I started. Um, there is um, a large number and um, a combined um, um, numbers of um, factors. So the first one is obviously um, interest rates, inflation, um, those two factors are causing um, a few problems for businesses. Um, the main um, factor it's causing is um, it's decreasing contributory uh, discretionary spending, um, and therefore that means consumers are spending less. And um, that's going to be a vicious circle, which sort of um, catches up for businesses. So their bottom line, their revenue decreases because consumers are spending less. Um, at the moment, we're not sure where inflation is, is heading towards. Um, there's a, been a figure of about up to 7.8%, uh, but it could be higher. Um, and obviously, interest rates is a main tool for, for governments to curb inflation. So um, that, that, that is playing its part in causing distress for businesses. Um, the second part is COVID. COVID, um, obviously, we've all gone through um, you know, a major part of history, COVID, um, and that's going to have a a lasting effect for business. Um, there were quite a lot of government incentives paid out during COVID um, and the government was basically handing out money. Um, now that the government needs to recoup that money and that means the tax office is on a mission to recoup um, outstanding taxes. Um, I think I heard a figure of about up to $100 billion in outstanding tax for the SME market. That's quite a large number. Now the tax office has to collect that, that, that money. And that means they're going to put a bit of pressure to business. So the ATO, um, the, there was rumours that they were they were very soft um, during COVID. They took their foot off the pedal, but they are now um, increasing their pressure in collecting revenue. So that 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 is going to have a, an effect of businesses and creditors also, you know, cash flows tight. So creditors are going to put a bit of pressure in trying to collect their, 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 their cash. So you're going to have a uh, bit more in activity in debt collection and um, lawyers if if you're not paying the debts and um, that's in, that's causing problems for businesses um labor shortage um there's a massive labor shortage in australia um and there's businesses in some industries where they cannot meet demand because they don't have a staff to meet that demand um, um especially in the manufacturing um, at, um industry you know there's businesses that cannot manufacture because they don't have the staff to complete that, that. Also professional services and, and other similar industries. 
And the final one, which we've never seen, is cyber risk. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, pressure in business for cyber crime. Now, hopefully not many businesses have been hit, but if you have been hit with a cyber crime, it could have significant consequential effects, which will affect your bottom line. And we have seen some major ones. Um, one was Optus. Um, I can't recall the medical one, but um, yeah, look, well, that's going to have effect for your financial um, numbers. So, you know, customers, um, it's going to cost you to rectify. So all these factors are playing their part in causing a lot of distress at the moment in the marketplace. Okay, thanks, Dom. Um, so taking those uh, challenges and risks into consideration, Mitch, uh, what kind of key signs in the business or warning signs in the business and indicators do you think people can look out for and identify to prepare and prevent themselves from um, insolvency? Okay, Kate, okay, thanks. Um, I'm simply going to read to a case, a famous case actually from um, 2003. So 20 years ago, um, Justice Mandy in the Waterwheel case actually just dictated in a judgment um, 14 indicators of insolvency. And I'll, I'll read to them momentarily, simply to say that two of those indicators seem to be a little bit out of date because they refer to payment by check. And I haven't seen any businesses for a decade really transact by check. But look, the indicators of insolvency as per Justice Mandy um, as follows. So continuing losses. So your business is making a loss and there's accumulated losses over a span of a, a, couple, a couple of years or longer. So that's one indicator. Um, second indicator could be a liquidity ratio uh, below one, meaning to say your current assets and your current liabilities, um, one divided by the other. If the ratio is below one, that may be an indicator of um, insolvency. Um, as Dom alluded to as well, um, overdue Commonwealth taxes, ATO, your ATO RBA, state taxes, payroll tax, what's payable to the OSR in New South Wales where, where we are. And um, also other um, pay, pay, payables to employees, for example, superannuation. So there's three uh, indicators there. Fourth listed by Mandy is as follows, and that's some um, poor relationship with the present bank, um, including an inability to borrow further funds. So if somebody that you're in business with as your lender is saying no, to further advancement, that, that's a good indicator of insolvency. Um, fifthly, uh, no access to alternative finance. So you might have a, um, a secured lender and you might be in the uh, a, a mezzanine market or a, a second tier or third tier market if um, those service providers are saying no. Again, another indicator. Um, sixthly, and I'll, I won't read them out. I won't, I won't read out the numbers anymore, but Next would be suppliers placing the company on cash and delivery. So suppliers um, demanding special payment before resuming supply. So shortening of credit terms. An inability uh, to raise further equity capital, meaning to say um, relying on shareholders of the business to, uh, to fund the business. Um, creditors being unpaid outside trading terms. In some industries, we come across trading terms could be up to 90, you know, up to 90 days or longer, for example, building construction, but generally accepted trading terms are 30 to 45 days. So anything well beyond that could be an indicator. This is what I refer to here. Um, Mandy had the issuing of post dated checks. So going back 20 years ago, when uh, paying by check was a reasonably common occurrence, basically fixing up your, your led, creditor ledger by issuing something but post dating it, I, the money, I hope the money will come in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks time, indicator. Following to the checks, dishonored checks, payment for bounce, that's clearly an indicator. Um, special arrangements uh, with selected creditors. So you may be short of cash and you may pick or prefer rather some creditors over others in relation to continue to supply. Um, further to that would be Credit is taking a further step. Um, solicitor's letters, letters of demand, summonses, judgments, and warrants issued against the company. Um, second to last would be actually looking at the payments ledger. Payments to creditors are rounded sums um, that aren't reconcilable to any specific invoices. So that's an indicator, sort of paying the money out to a preferred creditor 
when you have a you know when you have any money or a certain amount. And um, lastly, and this is um, quite important as well, is the inability to produce timely and accurate financial information to display the company's trading performance and financial position, and to make um, in order to make or to to show past performance and to make uh, reliable forecast. So there's 14 points that were conveniently listed, as I said, by Justice Mandy back in 2003. I was actually referring to behaviour of that company back in 19, further back in 1999. But that checklist is a good indicator today still of what to look out for or, or some points to look out for. Good old Justice Mandy. Justice Mandy. <laughs> It's quite interesting. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, I'll just quickly. So that that judgment is thousands of pages, um, and it, it's been probably the most litigated topic in insolvency. What it, you know, insolvent indicators in trade and insolvent trading. But the definition is quite simple, and uh, um, but it, people don't get it. It's as and when if you can't pay your debts, as and when they fall due, you're insolvent. That's really as basic as it is, um, but I call it a, the sleep test. So CFOs here, if you're not sleeping well because of financial pressure, then might be uh, something to look at. So, mm. yeah. I just wanted to make a point because um, it's something that we've kind of come across our desk uh, recently, which I found um, quite eye-opening and uh, important to note. And we've just touched on it both in when talking about the risks and the challenges, and then also preventing insolvency. And that that's the ATO. Um, and understanding the debt. And I think that that's maybe one um, indicator that people need to look at, especially coming up to end of financial year um, and what is owing to the ATO and what the time period of that debt is, um, especially with COVID. So one of the things that we've learned recently, and Dom, Mitch, jump in at any point to correct anything that I say, but uh, throughout COVID, you know, the ATO didn't chase debts. Um, they kind of left, left everyone away and now, people are coming back to those debts and looking to pay it. And it's important to note that that debt isn't, they didn't stop or pause it. It's still, if you've got debt from three years ago, it's a three-year-old debt. So look at um, what interest might be on that debt. And I really understand what is um, owing to the uh, tax office because I think that kind of is a common theme that we're seeing a lot. Um, did you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, we'll okay. do yeah, after you, Dom. Yeah, look, I agree. Look, the tax office, even they may have been helping the economy and businesses in allowing tax to be deferred or accumulate, um, mm -hmm. it's not helping now um, because, you know, businesses' revenue, as I said at the beginning, revenue is dropping, but a tax debt won't go away. Won't go away. The tax office won't write off tax debt. It's a, a, a you know, thousand-year-old public policy. The government won't write off tax. So businesses have this lingering tax debt with accumulating interest and in in very uh, tough economic environment. So that coupled together is causing quite a lot of distress. Um, so yeah, the solution is, you know, make sure you're on top of it and have a plan to work your way through that tax debt. Um, and obviously we will probably talk about ways to do that, but that, that's key for me. Well, that probably leads me to my next question, which is um, what are the key strategies and actions that people can implement um, after assessing the warning signs um, within a business to prevent um, an insolvency scenario? That's for you, John. Yeah, not me. Or Mitch. Oh. <laughs> Whichever one. Whoever wants to speak. <laughs> I'll start. Look, yeah, look, obviously, keep, look, keep, keep an eye out for the indicators. So Mitch ran through the key indicators. Um, and, you know, if there's any distress in any of aspect of the business, look at ways to, um, to find, you know, get out of that. So restructuring, um, you know, uh, uh, um, looking at key supplies, contracts, tax debt, and looking at ways to um, offload the pressure for your business. Um, you know, I would say the first step is talk to your advisors, usually accountants and lawyers, um, um, but also internally, look at um, an internal methods to, I call it um, balance, street, balance sheet restructuring um, or internal finance. Look at opportunities in your own balance sheet to offload pressure um, in aspects of your business. Um, so key strategies, uh, act early, get on top of your books. So as Mitch said, one of the key indicators is not having proper books and records. So make sure that you're up to date. Um, you know, there's a good old saying, you don't know, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you are. Um, so if, you need, if your books aren't up to date, it's going to be impossible for you to plan ahead. 
and get out of trouble, navigate through financial problems. Um, act early, the earlier the better, we always say. Um, you know, it is one of those um, uh, prevention is better than cure. Um, and it goes also for financial distress. We are called financial insolvency practitioners, financial corporate doctors. Um, and we get, give out the same advice as a doctor would prevent is prevention is better than cure. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, Mitch, just kind of bouncing off that, and as we lead into the end of the um, financial year, uh, how important is it uh, for CFOs and financial controllers to, um, to ensure the accurate, timely financial um, reporting for the organisation to ensure that they're uh, preventing an insolvency event? Okay, key, absolutely key. Um, having done this professionally for a couple of decades, um, overwhelmingly a theme that flows through insolvencies that I've seen is um, poor or non-existent management information systems and also timely um, financial accounts. So anything from setting your arguments bad, IAS income tax returns, um, you know, monthly board meetings with good quality data so that the leaders of the business can uh, make the decisions that need to be made. Um, look, in my experience, when a, when a business is terminal, um, yeah, poor quality financial information is, is, is certainly an, um, a contributor to these things. As Dom said, if you don't know who you are currently, how can, how can you plan for the future? And um, that's what that's, well, that's the CFO role as, as far as I'm concerned is good quality data as soon as it, as soon as it's available. Um, using these pressure points as um, as indicators to bring to um, you know owners or um, board members' attention. Please look at this. So, management information system critical. Good quality financial reporting critical. I think also. Um... An important factor to, to sort of take into account is um, there are two tests of insolvency, and I have seen this in many cases where, you know, directors and their accountants come to me and say, we're, 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 we're solvents, and they show me a set of balance sheet, and yes, they are balance sheet solvent, however, they're, they're cash flow insolvent, and it's quite important, and usually courts, you know, if you want the true test of insolvency, they look at your cash flow. If you cash flow, if you can't afford to pay your debts as and when they fall due, which is the pure definition of insolvency, you know, you are regarded as, um, you, know, you know, potentially insolvent. So, you know, you might be looking at a set of accounts and you're saying, look, we've got so many assets, we're quickly, you know, we've got more assets and liabilities, so we're nowhere near insolvent. Well, hang on, how about you look at your current liabilities and your current assets? You know, there's a lot of provisioning that goes on um, and, you know, you may not have provisions, your assets, um, and therefore, even though you might be seen as solvent on your books, you're potentially cash flow insolvent. So it's it's a good op opportune time, especially end of year, we are coming end of year to clean up the books and also look at those asset lines where you might say, well, you know, do we need to provision, do we need to reduce uh, right off? Um, so you've got a true test of your position. You know, I've seen it many times where we get presented a set of books um, and then once we, you know, go through those figures, um, it's a whole different picture. And um, Dom, if a company is trading insolvent, uh, what are the possible uh, threats um, or risks for business directors, stakeholders? Yeah. What could people be facing if they're business continues to trade insolvent? Yep. So the main one is um, obviously the business uh, facing insolvency. So um, the business may need to shut down if you haven't found solutions for the insolvency event. So, um, you know, a business closure is going to have consequential effects, um, you know, loss of goodwill, loss of value, enterprise value, um, employees lose their jobs, um, reputation, um, supply contracts terminate. There's a whole raft of, uh, of events that may or will cause further financial distress or, or damage. Um, the main part for directors is insolvent trading. So if you are a director and you're deemed to have traded whilst insolvent, um, you are personally liable for that debt. So, you know, if your spouse trade insolvent for six months, 
then any debt incurred and unpaid in that six month period, you're personally liable, which is quite a significant um, uh, consequence for directors because it puts their personal assets at risk. You know, uh, liquidators are able to pierce through the corporate veil and chase the, per the directors personally for insolvent trading. Yeah. Um, now, we're, we're here to not make everyone freak out too much. <laughs> Uh, we but done that, have we? The, good, <laughs> the good thing is um, is when a business does face an insolvency event or is um, facing potentially trading insolvent, there are some really good uh, options and solutions out there for businesses to uh, get through to the other side, be it um, to continue to trade or look at, at you know, a new, a new pathway. Um, what are some of those uh, solutions or can we just talk to some of those solutions uh, I'll start with you, Mitch, that you would recommend people look at. Okay, so the Corporations Act gives us some choices as to business continuity and all business closed down. So I'll just speak to business continuity at the moment. So the favoured uh, mechanism um, in insolvency to restructure a company is, vo is voluntary administration. Meaning to say that a um, somebody with my license or Dom's license is appointed as a voluntary administrator of the company. Then only we trade the business on. And at the end of that process, there's a deed of company arrangement which compromises the, uh, the debts owing to the company. But the idea of that part of the Corporations Act is to save jobs and business continuity because in a shutdown situation, you just there's destruction of value completely. So that's the preferred mechanism. Um, of, of recent date though, um, we have, I'm gonna call it um, voluntary administration light, and that's known as a um, small business restructure. Now that has certain um, precursors that have to be met before you can enter into small business restructure, but it's similar to um, voluntary administration, but uh, technically it's a debtor in possession um, mechanism. But it pr produces the same result. It's continuity and saving jobs. Um, the other uh, avenue available to boards as well is um, also safe harbour. Um, Dominic's executed one of these recently. But safe harbour is a, a mechanism whereby there's protection given to directors for to, from the threat of insolvent trading if you enter into safe harbour and you seek advice from a you know, professional qualified person. And that being the case, trying to go into safe harbour gives you some protection whilst you consider what your options are and to, to hopefully develop a better plan for a better outcome in a potential insolvent situation. So, what would be um, an ideal scenario where I would enter into safe harbour? Tom, do you, yeah. you've, look, you've, had the, you've had the immediate experience. Yeah, so. look, we've done a few. So there's um, when there's a you know there's a better outcome by entering. So obviously the directors are concerned. There's potential insolvency event, and the main um, the main effect of safe harbour is it protects directors from insolvent trading. So what I mentioned before, you know, if a, if a director you know is found to be trading insolvent for the last six months. Um, he can be personally liable. Now, if, it, if you know, in that six month period, the director has gone to a professional and, and sought safe harbour protection, um, then during that six months, um, that director is protected from insolvent trading. Um, now, the main, um, uh, uh, back to your question, Kate, um, mm -hmm. there's going to be a better outcome scenario. So by entering a safe harbour arrangement, um, you know that the steps that you are taking is going to provide a better return. And um, you know, I'll probably go for a case study where the case study touches upon safe harbor, voluntary administration, deed company arrangements. So all those three mechanisms were used in my case study, and I can show how it, it, it protects directors. But you know, one of the examples is as a white knight investor that's going to be putting money in, but you know, you've got a, an event that won't happen until three months from today. So what are you going to do in those three months until that white knight comes in and puts money into capital into the business? You're going to, you could potentially um, enter the safe harbour during that period, meaning that what you're doing isn't insolvent trading and you've got reasonable um, uh, prospect of success in getting capital injection. That's one of them. 
Um, you could be restructuring your debts. Um, you could be entering into a new contract, which will turn around the business. Um, there's many events that could potentially be happening in a short term, but in that period, you need protection because, you know, if it, you know, business is speculative, things don't go your way, you know, then why should directors put their necks out if they're going to be personally liable um, when they, you know, especially the ones that do have shareholders to respond to, why would a director put their neck out for six months until this white night capital investment comes in? So, you know, safe harbor is a solution there. Sounds like a good solution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mitch, did you want to add anything to that at all? Uh, the, the other alternative is, you know, in insolvency is obviously liquidation, but I mm. don't want to run into me on the presentation. Like liquidation is how it sounds. It's, it's the end of the business. Mm. You sell the assets, you make the financial recovery, and um, you take your fee and pay this, um, any excess money out to creditors. But there's complete loss of um, enterprise value there. And, um, and you know, I don't, that isn't what I would want to be talking about today. I'd, I'd hope that um, people in this seminar would be talking to professionals like myself and Dom well, well before you get to that, uh, that, that, that sort of stage. I don't know, plan for the worst, yeah. I think, and, and hope for a, a better outcome is yeah, outcome. what I could say. I think that kind of really leads us into the the next kind of thing I want to talk about, which is um, if I can get some examples of uh, a situation where a director uh, acted early and spoke to an insolvency um, practitioner early on to work through all the solutions before it was potentially too late and compared to a situation or a scenario where someone left it too late. Uh, and what the difference in those um, real life situations uh, looked like. So, Dom, have you got any any good stories you can share with the group? Yeah, look, I'll, so look, one that I have in mind. So, the director did act early. Um, it, it can't, obviously, I won't, I won't mention names, but he contacted us um, and he um, obviously had distress. He had the tax office chasing him, um, very restrictive cash flow. Um, However, he had a potential acquisition happening, but he didn't know the timing. It was an international purchaser buyer for his business, um, a large corporation. So, you know, negotiating with large corporations does take time. And he was just basically coming to a, a dead end and um, called us saying, look, I've given up. I'm going to, you know, I don't have enough time. I just want to liquidate. So we went through the scenario and we said, well, hang on, are you certain that, you know, that this buyer is going to potentially uh, make the acquisition? And he sort of said, yes, he will, but he won't pay enough to pay out everyone. So I might as well close the door. So we said, well, you know, that's probably not the best outcome for creditors because if you close today, everyone gets nothing. If you achieve this sale, you may actually make a, a decent return to your creditors. So we formulated a plan and we basically, um, it was a uh, two-stage plan. It was a safe harbour engagement where we, for a few weeks, um, allowed him to enter into safe harbour, allowed him to continue trading. Um, in that period, we were able to um, still negotiate with a purchaser. We spoke to the key creditors and gave them the plan and told them if you hold out, you know, there'll be a better, better return. So the main creditors supported uh, to the point that were, you know, allowing very deferred trade terms up to 90 days. Um, that freed up the cash flow, which allowed him to trade in the short term. Um, the purchaser came through. Now, the purchase price, as I said, wasn't enough to pay out everyone in full. But it was enough, you know, it was a lot more than the potential dire consequence of the, the director closing. So upon our safe harbour engagement concluding, we um, we couldn't do the matter because we were conflicted, but we provided the matter to um, another firm and they did a voluntary administration. Um, the voluntary administration was basically the injection of purchase price of the business and that achieved a significant return to creditors. So that was a perfect example where both Safe Harbour, Voluntary Administration, early prevention and talking to professional advisors made a whole massive difference. Um, you know, the director was quite stressed and he was just ready to close the doors and walk away. 
Um, so that wow. was a really successful case study for us. Um, and it just shows that, you know, we've, you know, with in all communication, I think it's key with your creditors, your key suppliers. You know, I think it's a lot better communicating with your suppliers rather than giving them the surprise of a letter from the liquidator saying, you know, we've closed the doors and you're not going to get any return. So um, it's amazing with a combination of those factors made such a successful restructure. Yeah. Great. Love a success story. Uh, any any situations or real life stories, um, Mitch or Dom, where you've seen a director leave it too late? Oh, oh yeah, I'm going every day. <laughs> yeah, time. I know. All it's all heartbreaking. I, yeah, my overwhelming experience, um, having consulted to companies in distress for nearly twenty years, is um, I, I would say ninety nine out of one hundred meetings, I've left the meeting thinking to myself, I wish I'd met you twelve to eighteen months earlier. The earlier you capture or the earlier you identify these issues, the earlier you seek advice. Again, going back to better outcomes, better outcomes can be achieved. Um, and overwhelmingly, I feel as though um, we're viewed as like the last people to speak to, when in fact, <laughs> we should be, you know, some of the first, as the case may be. The turnaround and restructure option preferred over liquidation consulting early and and generally just to everybody out there plan plan for the worst and anything mm. better than that is 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 a, is a better outcome so yeah more time well, the earlier you capture it the better you, the better we can do helping you and getting us a, a better return to your creditors so that that that's the story of my career <laughs> I think um, I think we see it a lot, and, and the reason is it's head in the sand syndrome. Um, mm. You know, when things get tough, directors, owners, shareholders, you know, it's tough for them. Seeing, you know, a lot of times businesses that they've been running for the last thirty years, it's been there. You know, blood, sweat, and tears have been poured over these businesses. It's you know, it's been their family. Um, you know, their kids have gone through the era of this business, and seeing it, you know, in tough situations. You know, it's it's hard making hard decisions. Um, so you know, a lot of times, you know, people don't. They by the time they realise they need to do something, it's too late. So you know, as we always say, act early, talk. Um, you know, talk to your accountants, talk to your professional advisors, um, ask the questions because yeah, there is so much so much internal opportunity for businesses to look at internal, and doesn't need to necessarily mean a voluntary or formal appointment. Obviously, they're, they're the last resort type of stuff, but there's so many opportunities for, for business to look at financial restructure within their balance sheet. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, as I said before, internal finance, you know, what is internal finance? Getting cash, squeeze, squeezing cash or cash flow out of your internal balance sheet um, items. Um, and just talking, I think. But um, yeah, as Mitch said, 99 out of 100, it's just amazing how many businesses we, we see. And we always say, gee, wish you came to us earlier. And I think definitely um, understanding and knowing your numbers and being able to communicate, communicate those back to your board and your directors is really critical, um, especially for the audience here today, to be able to kind of give as much information as possible so that um, your directors and your boards and can make those decisions on which path to to take yeah. um, and have those discussions early so i think that's also really really important also i haven't i didn't, I didn't really mention it before but another thing we're seeing a lot more is um finances i mean obviously they know that there's a bit of a uh, um, uh, financial pressure for businesses so they are tightening their lending also they're tightening their their reporting um, their LVRs, so loan to value ratios. So what we're seeing, we're actually doing a bit of work for financiers. We're being asked to, you know, do some DD due diligence for their clients. And one thing that I'm seeing a lot is we, you know, we we do approach the clients and um, they're not ready for it. Um, their books are not up to date. Um, and then for it puts the financier, um, uh, it makes them a bit nervous. So you know, having um, up-to-date, accurate books, you know, may also help if, you know, you've got your financiers or your shareholders asking the questions. Wow. Yeah. Okay, how are we going for time? Are we, are we all good? 
we ready for We're, questions? Yeah, I've got a couple. We've got um, a few minutes left. Um, I'll just have a look through. Um, I can read one out if, if, yep. if I may. Um, here's for, um, one from Anonymous. Why does it seem there are so few prosecutions um, for insolvent trading despite so many companies seemingly going into liquidation overnight? Um, we say, okay, so prosecutions, <laughs> yeah, insolvent trading uh, mostly is a civil remedy, meaning to say that you seek um, compensation and money to compensate them from a director for insolvent trading. So prosecutions, do you mean liquidators pursuing or do you mean uh, do you mean uh, prosecuting, i.e. criminal? I'm not sure. So, so well, I'll, I'll, I I'll speak, I'll speak to civil. A... If, just speak to civil, Dom. Yeah, civil, yeah. You, I mean, there are a lot. There, there are, are a lot. Yeah, so it's quite, it's quite interesting. I, I, look, I've had that question before, so I know how to answer it. But um, you know, a criminal, a criminal prosecution means ASIC needs to take action. Um, now, usually ASIC would only take action for high, look, very, very limited cases have involved ASIC taking action. And I think Plymouth was one of them. So the one that Mitch mentioned at the beginning, that was ASIC versus Plymouth. It's very rare. Um, it's usually the liquidator that takes action for insolvent trading. Now, look, um, and it's it's a data um, issue. There, in most cases, if the directors have property, they are prosecuted, but it's an out-of-court settlement. So you may not hear that there's um, insolvent trading claims made by the liquidators, but that's because it's made out of court um, you know, liquidators, and I speak for myself, I'm not sure about Mitch, you know, we, we, we do get nervous going to court. I mean, going to court is a very expensive process. There's risks. You know, um, directors do have defences, you know, and they may have a valid defence. So a lot of these liquidations that um, the question posed, um, yeah, the, the insolvent trading does get prosecuted, but it's out of court settlements. That's my view on, on that. Yeah, that, Mitch, and that would be my general experience as well. Yeah. If the director does have assets that are identifiable, um, we will commence proceedings, but it's rare that it actually gets to um, a, a court process. Usually these things are settled uh, beforehand, as Dom intimated, and that's that's my experience as well. Any other okay. questions? Um, just a more general one, just about um, resources like available do you is it like what are the best next steps if you are unsure um, if, you know if you there are concerns in your business um, is it best to reach out to you or access resources online what would it I guess yeah for, for someone sitting there wondering what to do uh, where to turn um, yeah what kind of things do you um, does McCain Goodwin offer I think um, one of them was Kate. I'm not sure if it's actually still happy. We did have a, uh, we, well, I think we did, the financial yeah, health check. Yeah, so we've got a financial health check um, that can be done online. Um, and what that does, it gives you a very holistic view of your business in critical areas. Um, and basically gives you a health check. So, um, and from that, you can gauge where you are and what, what areas you can fix. Um, and then obviously we can help in fixing those areas. Uh, might be collection of your accounts receivables. So, you know, that's a key indication. If your books, if your debtors are 90 days plus owing to you, then you've got a problem. So you've got to, you know, fine tune your collection strategies and terms. Um, could be your HR, you know, if you've got a high turnover of staff, then maybe you got to fix your HR um, there because, you know, tight, a turnover of staff is an issue. Um, it, it is also potentially an indication of insolvency, um, but also an indication of your business. So, yeah, that's one of the tools. But also, we can you know, we have we like chatting, um, you know. And once we start asking questions, we get a good understanding of what needs to be fixed. I think no situation. What what we find is no situation is exactly the same. So approaching um, and working with each business um, with a solution orientated mindset to find the right path for them and understanding and listening to them is really critical. So. I would say the first thing to do is just pick up the phone and have a chat because um, yep. that's where it all starts from there because you can get your options, you can think everything through. You don't have to, you know, take an action right then and there. Um, you can kind of gather as much information as possible and that's also why that business health check is 
is a really good tool because it can give you that oversight of the different areas and how they're performing for you. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think we're nearly at time, um, but we'll we'll be in touch with everyone after this session and we'll give them, um, we'll pass on your details. So if anyone does want to get in touch and have that conversation, they can do so. Um, and if there are any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can um, we can put you in touch with Kate, Dom and Mitch um, and yeah, and get you the answers you need. So okay. yeah, I think that's, that's us about time. Um, now I'm just trying to find where I've located my slides to give you an idea <laughs> of what we've got next. Um, we've got some other sessions coming up after this. So we've got uh, the two faces of a CEO, is it possible? Um, and we've got a case study session with uh, Ash Weenie on how to transform the finance function. Um, yeah, so stay, stick around. Um, we're nearly at the end of the day. We've got, I think, four more sessions. Um, yeah, and thanks for joining us. Thanks. Great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, bye. Good afternoon.